Welcome back, investors. Today, we are talking about Realty Income Corporation. They are what's known as an REIT stock, which is a real estate investment trust. Um, people really like these because it allows them to earn income off of rental or real estate properties without having to own real estate themselves. It's also a great way to earn um passive income, so to speak, um, you know, compared to looking for growth stocks and such. A REIT is bound by certain rules to pay certain percentages of their income out as dividends, and uh, it's usually a very high percentage. Of course, you can look here at their top 20 clients, and um, they do a very good job insulating themselves from consumer behaviors. All of their top 20 clients fall into at least one of the categories of service-oriented, non-discretionary, low price point, or in the case of FedEx, non-retail. That's a big part of why this company is so popular with the REIT investment community. They're very well diversified. We'll talk some more about their investment philosophy here towards the end. And I just want to dive right in. Uh, and I've, I haven't already said it, you know, this is a, an opportunity to introduce how to evaluate REITs. They're very different from other typical stocks in the market. And so that requires different approaches, different um, formulas and ratios and those kinds of things. Some of them are very similar because it is functionally a stock, but quite a few are different. Now, I will open by saying I don't have a lot of experience with REITs. I'm doing this because I know a lot of people have questions and hopefully I can give at least at least get you thinking about things to look for. Of course, not all of these are going to be perfect explanations, and so I always encourage my audience, you know, do your own research here. Make sure that what I'm saying, you know, fact check this, so to speak, to make sure that I'm not telling you something that's not going to give you the correct information to make your own decisions. Now, current price running right around 60. Price history has been sitting around that for a while. Of course, with REITs, you're not going to see so much growth. You know, maybe when real estate's up, more and more people are buying into it. Of course, the more people buy, the more the price increases um, just due to the nature of uh, price fluctuations in the market. But pretty steady, right around 1% increase over the last five years. Looking at some of the basic fundamental ratios, um, just an overview of uh, what the company looks like just from a glance, you know, good audit board, shareholder and compensation score, shareholder a little high, but, um, you know, still not terrible. Profit margins, nice, solid double digits, return on assets, return on equity, somewhat low. Past five-year growth, actually kind of negative, but the next five-year growth projected to be about 22.5%. Solid operating and levered free cash flows. Now, here on the right side, we see P slash FFO. Now, we can't use earnings in the traditional sense with a real estate investment trust because with real estate, you, of course, have the problem that um, you have depreciation, you have amortization, and those are going to affect the actual, you know, not the land value, but the property values themselves. And since that's where they derive most of their earnings, we have to adjust for those things. So we're going to get to that in a minute with FFO. Those are funds from operations. And that essentially replaces the concept of earnings. So we don't want to use a PE. We also don't want to functionally use free cash flow for most of our ratios because that as well is going to be influenced by depreciation. Now price per sales, two and a half, pretty good. Price per uh, funds from operation running around 15, so pretty good there. Solid dividend growth, 26 years straight, um, 3.7 four over the last five years and just a nice solid annual dividend yield of course we want to look at credit rating here in a little bit um, we'll get into that when i discuss the information that i pulled from the 10k of course most of this is going to be quantitative there's only a small percentage of the things that i found in the 10k that i thought were worth sharing of course go and read that for yourself because there may be some other important things in there for you to find so current ratio has increased significantly over the last five years, actually almost 30% increase. So that's really great. Um, went all the way up to five um, back in 2020. Of course, real estate market was really popping during COVID as people were buying um, in new locations due to remote work. 
cache generating power ratio is actually one of the 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 non bright spots of this company. This company is it, it's really healthy. When you really look at everything, I'm very impressed with the way the company's run. I'm very impressed by the competitive advantage that they've managed to build in their selectiveness. Now, on cash generating power ratio, that of course is the ability to generate cash from operations. Now, this could also be influenced right from external factors um, or maybe is similar to the whole earnings issue. So definitely something you want to look at. But typically, this is looking at your uh, cash from operations to see how much is coming from actual operations versus coming from financing or investing um, cash flows. So really, you see a large decrease. If you jump down there to debt per EBITDA, the leverage ratio, we see that that has actually increased significantly, almost 13% over the last five years. And I think that has to do with this cash generating power ratio. They have had to take on a significant amount of debt over the last five years, up to 137% um, over EBITDA. So that I think is decreasing that cash generating power ratio because more and more of the funds coming into the company had to come from debt in order to continue to pay the bills. So interest coverage ratio, this is an important one. Uh, just shows how well they can pay the interest on their loans. Um, absolutely crucial for a company in real estate that has to leverage themselves quite a bit. 2.56% growth, so very solid. Um, well, right around two and a half, up to about three over the last five years. Very healthy place there. Debt service coverage ratio. This is kind of a challenging ratio to calculate. Um, but it essentially looks at how well they can cover their debt from the um, actual, again, operations income that's coming in. Um, of course, you know, you can kind of see her on the left. I made some notes. And to a great deal, um, you really kind of got to dig into interest payments and principal payments. I didn't dig that far in. Um, and so that's something to kind of look at if you're really trying to get down to very specific numbers. And and to clarify, you know, I, I do try to get as specific as possible, but there are always things in the notes to the financial statements on the 10K that you kind of have to factor in. There's a lot of information out there that doesn't always get priced in, you know, this whole efficient market thing. Um, you know, some analysts do the work and they're very thorough, but there's quite a few that just look at the surface level and price things in that way. On the capitalization level, how they fund the corporation, again, debt levels have increased significantly, kind of a negative, but again, mostly positive. Debt to assets um, has decreased, so that's good. Um, more and more assets on the books compared to the amount of debt. So that's typically represents um, a greater amount of equity as well. Looking at tangible book value per share, that's increased by about 6% over five years. So that's good as well. Um, this next section is kind of where, again, you know, doing my best work here, this is something I'm kind of new at when we're looking at trying to evaluate the actual price, um, the value of the assets that this company owns. It's challenging because, for example, say you were going to sell your house tomorrow and you asked 10 of your friends to tell, tell you what that house is worth you're going to get 10 different answers, more than likely. And the reason for that is people look at real estate and they value it differently. And this can happen as well um, when you have something as challenging as an entire company that functions off of a vast and diverse portfolio of real estate. When you're trying to collectively decide what it's all worth so that you can decide what each share of the company is worth. So I've looked at two different ways that we can do this. One is very simple. One is it requires a lot of, well, just guessing uh, more than anything. So the simple one is that pink line. Um, you can calculate net asset value as the value of the assets minus the value of the liabilities divided by the total shares outstanding. Very simple way to do it. The, um, of course, the potential alternative then the purple lines, um, as you can see, it's very complicated. You have to kind of figure out, okay, what's their cap rate? You have to work backwards 
to determine based off operating income what a ballpark property value would be subtract out the mortgage debt um, and then that hopefully will give you the theoretical net asset value divided by number of shares or and then divided by the price to figure out what it's trading at well again one's very simple one's very complicated one uses a lot of guessing one's fairly straightforward so again traditional net asset value per share runs between 26 and 39 nice eight percent increase over the last five years i'm probably going to trust that ratio a little more because it looks accurate this other one is kind of questionable again you know i had to kind of come up with what do i think the cap rate is well there's not an easy answer for that because it also relies on knowing what the value of the the uh, properties are right cap rate is say you own a hundred thousand uh, a million dollar property and you make sixty thousand a year off of that property you got a cap rate of six percent well again you have to know what the value of the property is and how much you're making each year from it we have operating income so we know how much it's making but again we also have to know what is the property worth so we could just use total assets maybe that may be one way of doing that but as far as the cap rate i just use return on average assets and i just averaged out that over the last five years and used that rate again a lot of assumptions have to be made in this method of doing things but it's one way of doing it and that's why i'm showing it so of course you can get your operating income and that gives you this you know ballpark property value which runs about a 15 percent increase over the last five years very nice take out the mortgage debt here i just use total long-term debt because it's an example and i didn't dig too deep but you can typically find some of the mortgage debt in the 10k i didn't feel like it gave me enough information to really give a good answer to that so again i just use total long-term debt of course that's not accurate because it's not all mortgage debt that gave me a theoretical net asset value which increased by around three percent over the last five years i felt like that was fair but then you divide it by number of shares and you have a negative 12 percent increase so maybe i messed up something there again you know i always encourage you double check this stuff i'm presenting it just as an introduction to the concept not to say i've got it totally figured out so um you know we can take that down here and we're going to come back to that net asset value when we get into distributions you know typically i look at working cash flow i look at capitalization i look at profitability when an reit you really have to look at distributions that's the whole allure of owning that stock that company is because it's going to pay you and you need to know how much you can trust that company to continue to pay you to continue to earn enough to afford to pay you um you're not as um worried necessarily um about other things because that's typically your biggest concern you're wanting some kind of passive income from owning this compared to maybe a growth stock so on profitability very good signs here again we have to use ffo funds from operations or affo which is adjusted funds from operations <clears throat> and we're using that in place of earnings per share because earnings per share is inaccurate with an reit so we see a nice four and a quarter percent increase over five years with that affo our price per affo um nice and reasonable between 19 to 16 so a nice three percent decrease over five years that's what you want to see there on revenues we see a 20 percent increase over five years very healthy place there operating income 14 point roughly 14.7 so very good increase there our operating margin so when you factor in expenses um you know it, it is a decrease over five years so that's not great um and then our return on average assets again we have to use affo for this and that is a decrease of four percent over five years you want higher than five percent and they pretty much stay there except for 2021 and so nice healthy place i think for realty income corporation now um, we get into distributions this is where we're using some new ratios that i haven't covered before we're looking at a payout ratio we're looking at the distribution yield and we're using that against our other asset net asset value and our per the traditional net asset value i say traditional but it's a simpler version our dividend coverage ratio and the dividend amount 
So our payout ratio, um, this is your dividends per FFO. And um, I'm going to see if I can get it in your screen here. You know, if you used earnings per share, it would give you a 216% um, payout ratio, which is incorrect. If you use free cash flow, it would give you negative 125%. When you use the AFFO, it gives you right around 83%. Of course, greater than 100 is a likely dividend cut. You want a smaller amount, but negative 125 is not accurate in the slightest. So um, we use FFO and we get a nice, mostly decrease, which is uh, good, but it hits around 94% in 2021. So kind of a negative there, I've highlighted it. On our distribution yield, Again, depending on how we go about calculating this, what assumptions we make, we either see that increasing by 16% or decreasing by 5%. Now, the distribution yield is different from a dividend yield. Um, this is looking at total funds that you can distribute versus necessarily what you distribute. Um, and it factors in some different things than your dividend yield. So definitely go look at that because again, uh, very different. Um, it sounds the same, but it's not. Now, looking at our DCR, our dividend coverage ratio, again, we're going to use AFFO, um, and we get a nice 1% increase. So really just, you know, you want to see more than 100%. That means they can cover it. And of course, we see well over 100, um, 120, 130 for five years. So very healthy place there to be able to cover the dividends they're paying out. They make plenty um, of income to cover that. D dividend amount, again, over the last five years, 2.3% increase, very healthy place to be at. And so again, noteworthy, um, like I said, there wasn't a ton of stuff in the 10K I felt like I really needed to bring up. No major red flags, I feel like. Um, just basic ballpark information about the company that I think all investors should know. They're very retail focused, um, as I mentioned. They're the monthly dividend company because they pay monthly. They have, this is one of the really cool things, they have a 99% occupancy of 12,237 properties across 84 separate industries. They only have 123 properties, I think, that are not filled at the moment with um, people leasing. They have an A3 slash A minus credit rating that allows them for 80 basis points over the benchmark rate. So a pretty healthy place there. I think that um, some of the challenges of the last year have made REIT susceptible to having not as great credit um, because there's higher likeliness of their tenants or clients not being able to pay. Um, and so that can be challenging if that happens and the company has to pick up those leases or can't. Um, their leases um, specifically for this company require their clients to be responsible for certain property expense expenses, including taxes, insurance, and maintenance. So that's good because the company's not on the hook for all of those things for their properties. Um, they mentioned that they factor in rent increases, and these are based on three things. Um, there are fixed increases already built into their contracts. There are inflation-based increases. Um, of course, those have ceilings, but that also protects the company and your investment. And then they have additional rent um, increases based on percentages of gross sales above certain levels. So that means that the business is performing well, while realty income is going to be doing better as well. Their ideal client pr profiles, this is, I think, where they get some competitive advantage. They focus on reliable and sustainable cash flow companies. Um, revenue per cash flow from multiple sources. So the businesses they invest in can't make cash from one, one source. They need multiple sources coming in. They have to have long-term leases. So these are 10 years or greater um, leases. Um, and I note in there... Um, top right, several of those leases that they have don't expire until, until 2,143. Um, that's a healthy place to be in for real estate um, because the longer of a contract you have, the better. Um, of course, this can work against you. Um, I believe it is the Sears company got a lease with the Mall of America back in the 90s when they were one of the biggest companies in the world for like ten dollars a year for a hundred years which is insane in itself but they've been um in litigation with the mall of america over this lease because they want to keep it but sears doesn't 
totally exist anymore. It kind of does, but not really. Um, and so definitely Google that. That was a wild story I read um, a couple months ago. So again, um, they want large owners and users of real estate. So they want people who have shown they can be profitable. They want people that show that they can be in it for the long term and people who show that they know how to use the real estate themselves. Um, they desire clients with physical and e-commerce sales mixes, which is unusual, right? If you're into retail, you probably want brick and mortar, but they want clients who are, <clears throat> again, diversified. Um, so going into this, they leverage the cost of losing prime location for lease retention. So that's important. Um, their top 10 industries, largest, smallest are grocery stores, convenience stores, dollar stores, restaurants, quick service, drug stores, home improvement, restaurants, casual dining, health and fitness, automotive service, and general merchandise. Um, the property types, um, largest to smallest, include retail, industrial, gaming, and other. Other includes agricultural and office space. Their top client, 4%, um, is Dollar General. Um, one of the challenges of a company like this, this is just top down, right? So bottom up is looking at mostly quantitative, looking at the specific company and the factors that affect it. Top down is looking at macro um, economic shifts, large economic policies and um, regulations, those kinds of things that can affect a company but aren't necessarily directly tied to it. So one of the top down things is real estate's illiquid, right? If they have a, a non-prime location, they have to get rid of it to raise cash. It can be difficult. They don't necessarily know what they'll get for it. They may not get it at the right price. And that's the challenge of, again, figuring out what the company's worth, what their assets are really worth. Um, and then again, they cite a debt service coverage ratio of 5.2%, which may contradict what I had up there. But again, they, you know, they can calculate their principal and interest payments better than I probably can. Again, I'm not an expert. I just want to uh, – I'm learning this stuff for myself, and I'm wanting to share it with others. Um, and then this is a screenshot I took out of the 10K. This is a percentage of their total portfolio annualized contractual rent. These are their biggest clients, which you saw up above, Dollar General being the biggest. And really, I just wanted to show this on the screen so you've seen it um, if you don't end up going and reading their 10K for yourself. That's all I have for you guys today. I hope that this has been helpful. I hope that it's at least started um, getting some wheels spinning in your head. If if you're you know more of an expert than me and I said something totally wrong or you know might be misleading anybody in any way, drop that in the comment and let me know. Um, I can always uh, come back to this topic and correct some things. So give me some feedback there, obviously. Um, and then, of course, if you have questions, comments, concerns, drop those in the comments as well. Um, and then, as always, you know, like and subscribe. I appreciate every single person that's done so already. Um, you've made this so worthwhile for me to continue to make these videos. I hope this has been helpful. As always, dig in, invest well, and I will see you next time.